how food is related to autism and how both of them are interconnected and uh, hopefully at the end of the session we may able to rule out many of the myths and we were able to know the facts and what are the various uh, ways and uh, causes and factors which are involved in uh, the relation between the food and autism so i'll begin my talk with the overview of the presentation what we'll be doing here uh the most important thing is why should we worry about food in autism see uh the main thing is that uh, there are a lot of things and there are a lot of uh, you know uh, myths that uh, if one child is in on gfcf diet probably every child should be on a gfcf diet and if one of the parents is getting the benefits the other child may also get the benefits with the same type of food and with the same type of uh, diet which they are following so basically the thing is that uh, we should worry about food in autism there are some major factors which are responsible which make us worry about the food in autism the most important thing is intolerance or allergies to gluten now there is a difference between the intolerance and allergies i have taken both of them together so that we can explain in the future slides that there is a lot of difference between the intolerance and allergies and we are more concerned with intolerance related to gluten and casein in respect to autism second thing is intolerance to casein gut dysbiosis now uh, our research and our thinking towards autism has changed a lot and it is now more and more related to the gut lot of research and rcts that is randomized controlled trials which are considered to be one of the best with best evidence and level 1 evidence have been released recently and there is a lot of uh, literature is there related to gut dysbiosis connection between the brain and the gut so because of that our knowledge about autism now has been more focused towards the altered gut we know that there are a lot of factors are there which are responsible might be epigenetics might be environmental might be genetics might be stress might be uh, the mode of delivery cesarean or whether it is a normal delivery whether what type of antibiotics so all the factors related right from the conception till the child is diagnosed with autism all the factors are involved but ultimately the research has shown that all these factors together basically act on the gut so as a result of which our now main aim is towards gut healing to resolve this gut dysbiosis because if we are able to resolve that the connection between the gut and the brain which is considered to be one of the major factors responsible for the transmission of various uh, you know toxins and all so as a result our focus is on gut dysbiosis and how it is related to the food we'll be discussing that is why i have put up this uh, uh, i mean the word gut dysbiosis in the first slide now yeast issues yeast issues is again a very big issue and uh, it can be present in various forms there are no particular signs and symptoms or clinical features it can vary from right from the skin allergies to the sensory issues relating to the gut relating to the hyperactivity there can be a lot of things which can be present over the yeast issues so this is another important factor why we are worried about the food in autism other important thing is effect of type of carbohydrates uh unknowingly uh we know that gluten uh, rice white rice casein and corn they are considered to be gluten free but they are considered to be simple carbohydrates so what is the difference between this simple carbohydrates and complex carbohydrates and how this type of carbohydrate affects our food behaviors and affects our core symptoms in autism that we'll be discussing and nevertheless the last is the effect of oxalates now oxalates have been in a lot of discussion nowadays uh, many a times we see that in children they are having very high oxalate levels parents are worried and even our thinking is that high oxalates could be related to the kidney stones but the fact in autism is somewhat different the uh, why the oxalates are high in children it is related to the foods primarily rather than that of any kidney disease or any genetic disorders so that is why i have put up this effect of oxalates in relation to the food so these are the various uh, uh, points we'll be discussing in our future slides and at the end of the presentation hopefully we will we will be able to clear our knowledge and after discussion through all this uh, topics 
So the first and the foremost thing is that before going to the various type of diets and what are the various, uh, types of diets, what are the food we should consume, we should basically know the basic pathophysiology or you can say the basic understanding why this food is important. So the first and the foremost thing is about allergy and intolerance. We generally get confused about allergy and intolerance. Uh, so what is allergy basically? See, allergy is an allergic reaction. It is considered to be an allergic reaction when the immune system reacts to a harmless substance, which is known as allergen. Now, it's a very simple definition. There is nothing to be explained in that. The body gets reacted to in an unusual way to an any harmless substance. So the important thing is here, it is a harmless substance. Now, this harmless substance can be in the form of food. It can be in the form of latex. It can be in the form of dust, pollen grains, anything. So and as a result of which it causes the trigger of our immune system but and results in the production of antibodies now here the important thing we should remember here that allergy is due to an ige mediated reaction so ige is an antibody so when we go for an any allergen test we check the levels of ige it is not uh, any other antibody it is ige so these antibodies they get travel to the different parts of the body and they release chemicals as a result of which we may get symptoms of allergy and the most common symptoms of allergy we know that it can be allergic rhinitis running nose cough and cold or maybe frequent infections throat infections sinuses so these are the various things uh, the presentations of an allergy which can present and there are various lots of things through which a child can develop allergy so that is the importance of going for an allergic test now what is intolerance See, intolerance is not IgE mediated reaction, it is IgG mediated. And the most important thing we should remember that IgG mediated reaction most commonly takes place through the food items. It can be milk, it can be soya, it can be eggs, it can be any other food material. Now, here I have highlighted this in red, any other food additives. Now, this food additives is very, very important because intolerance or the IgG levels are not only related to the milk, soya, egg, but to lot of many things in the food, which we cannot judge unless and until we have an intolerance levels of that particular food. The child may be intolerant to peanuts. We may be thinking the child is intolerant to only gluten or maybe casein without going for the test. But he might be, when we go for an uh, intolerance test, it might be an eye opener for us. It may be intolerant to lentils, they may be intolerant to pulses, they may be intolerant to lots of things. So the idea of that is that, uh, of going for that intolerance is that we get to know the levels of IgG. And other thing is that there are a lot of food proce uh, processed foods are there which contain preservatives, which may contain sweeteners, coloring agents. Most of them contain salicylates and gluten. So other important use is that when we go for this IgG levels, we get to know the levels of intolerance towards gluten. Other than gluten, we can also get to know the levels of intolerance so for many other products. Uh, now, gluten is what and what is casein. We'll be discussing that because it is not important only for gluten. It is important that what are the varieties of food to which the child is intolerant, which is containing gluten. Now, gluten is present maybe in the wheat, oats, barley and rye. But the level of intolerance may be different for a wheat, maybe rye, maybe oats. Uh, naturally, oats uh, are gluten-free, but nowadays, because of the cross-contamination with the wheat, the chances of gluten levels are also high in oats. But talking uh, in relation to oats, they are actually, naturally, they are uh, gluten-free. Now, other important thing is that whenever we are going for any processed foods, practically, it is not possible that we can go for process, uh, we can avoid the processed foods for the children. But sometimes, whenever on and off, of, whether it is a birthday parties or anything, it is for the purpose of a knowledge that these are some of the artificial sweeteners or preservatives which have found to be to cause hyperactivity in some percentage of children. Uh, the evidence is not clear cut, but they have found to be having associated with hyperactivity in some percentage of children. These are E102, E124, E110. So these are some of the most important ones which can cause hyperactivity to some percentage of children. Now, other thing is that what are the causes of food intolerance? Now, the causes of food intolerance, the most important one is lactose intolerance. Now, many a times we see that the child is not able to digest the mother's milk and he starts having a lot of potties, there will be constipation or he's not able to tolerate the normal, uh, you know, uh, Nestle uh, product or your uh, 
packed milk or amul milk whatever milk so there the child may be having lactose intolerance or may be having the casein intolerance so the important thing is that the causes it can be varied from many a things first most is like there may be absence of lactase enzyme which is responsible for the digestion of lactose and lactose we know that lactose and casein these are the normal protein uh, these are the products these are the i mean lactose is not a protein it is a form of monosaccharide so they are present in milk and casein which is a protein which is also present in a dairy milk so other important causes are like irritable bowel syndrome now irritable bowel syndrome can present with lot of you know gi symptoms like constipation diarrhea bloating for our purpose for the present uh, uh, presentation the most important thing for us to know is autism spectrum disorder so autism spectrum disorder whenever we go for a test or a food allergy or food intolerance test it is most important that we go for the igg levels so whether you call it as a food intolerance or food allergy that is not a concern our concern is that we are more concerned with igg levels rather than ige levels because many a times when we go for ige levels in the children who are on the spectrum the levels might come out to be normal but when we go for igg levels the levels comes out to be very very high now why does it happen and what is the factor which is responsible see firstly uh, what are the effects of food intolerance now that uh, how can we predict that the child who is in the spectrum is having intolerance to gluten or casein or what are the signs and symptoms or what are the clinical picture which can tell us that yes my child might be intolerant to gluten or casein most important he might be uh, frequent uh, infections of rhinitis sinusitis or asthma or maybe adenoids hypertrophy no doubt their immune system is immature or it is not very strong enough it is disbalanced the disbalance causes because of the food intolerance the igg levels are very high in respect to other in respect to other immunoglobulins as a result the balance of the immune system gets disturbed in the children and because of this disturbance in the immune system they are more prone from these infections like respiratory infections gastrointestinal infection what we call as the gut issues there are a lot of symptoms of reflux vomiting diarrhea nausea constipation and among all these symptoms the most important ones are the gastrointestinal or gi symptoms about 20 to 25% of the symptoms which are present in relation to food intolerance in children who are on the spectrum are of gi symptoms skin they are more related to fungal infections rather than G igg or a food intolerance then yes central nervous system we know that if they are having high intolerance level to igg towards gluten and casein they can cause mood swings increase in hyperactivity allergy uh, hyperactivity behavioral symptoms may be more uh, or they may be more and more restless so why does it happen we'll be discussing but these are some of the various uh, presentations which can give us an idea yes the child might be intolerant to gluten and casein so uh, other important thing i was discussing that uh, many a times uh, there is always a question among the parents that sir aaj mere bete ne thoda sa gluten kha liya to uska effect kab tak rahega now this uh, we have to understand that the food intolerance reaction or igg antibodies when they occur they remain in our body for at least 3 to 4 months this is the minimum time period so as a result for example the child is intolerant to gluten and i have taken gluten today for example i have taken gluten biscuits two gluten biscuits now the antibodies which are formed towards this gluten are igg so these antibodies when they are formed they might form within a period of 3 days up to and they remain in the body up to a period of 3 to 4 months so unless and until these antibodies are not eliminated from the body the child may react to this gluten in various forms either they may be increase in hyperactivity or they may be gut issues they may be skin issues now when these symptoms appear that totally varies from child to child depending upon the level of intolerance he might present immediately after giving the suppose he has taken gluten today he might react immediately the next day the mother might see there is an increase in hyperactivity there is an increase in gut issues or it may present even after 3 to 4 days or may present after 15 days because it all depends upon the level of intolerance other thing is that once we have consumed gluten how much amount that doesn't matter the important thing is level which determines how much duration it will take so generally speaking once we consume gluten 
to uh, to completely wean off from the effect of that it takes minimum 3 months because that time that much is the time period for the igg antibodies to get eliminated from the body so now this is the uh, interpretation of food intolerance so how we get an uh, food intolerance test this is for the purpose of a knowledge see the uh, the thing which i was discussing is about the level of intolerance normally when we go for any igg level test uh we consider as an elevated when the levels are considered to be more than 30 so borderline we take it as between 25 to 30 and normal we take it as less than 24 so any child who is having an intolerance level of more than 30 it can be considered to be an an elevated levels now among these elevated levels we can also check suppose he is having a level of 70 so we know that it is slightly elevated and some children might have an levels of more than 100 100 to gluten in casing that means we can say that the intolerance level is very very high so accordingly we can predict yes this child may require gluten free diet or a casein free diet for this much period or at least for this much period compared to this child who is having an intolerance level of less than 100 so this is the purpose of going for this intolerance test now what is gluten in casein now gluten and casein we all know that they are basically proteins which are present in wheat products and which are present in casein product i mean which are present in dairy products so important thing is that casein now casein is a protein which is present in all the dairy products now whether it is a goat milk whether it is a buffalo milk whether it is a cow milk sheep milk it is present all in all the mammals including the human milk that means the breast milk so that is why what happens uh when the child is born see the precursors of autism are formed well within the womb or when the child is in the uh, womb but the problem is the symptoms appear only when the child reaches to the age of 18 months or so because before that our approach as parents is that we generally neglect those things and we are not able to pinpoint those minute features which are present in the children which give us an indication that there might be some risk factor for the children uh, going into the spectrum but when the child which is the age of around 18 months or so we start seeing this ye bolta nahi hai ye apne peers se piche hai then only we realize that there is something going wrong but the children who are who are having this uh, who have developed this precursors of autism right from the birth only they may not be tolerating the mother's milk they may be having frequent diarrhea they may be having frequent bloating constipation and as a result we never go towards this case in we go for the lactose intolerance test and as a result what we do we get a lactose intolerance report the child is being told that yes by the professional by a doctor the child is lactose intolerant so we switch on to a lactose free like it can be a soya based which can be a newsobe or there are different different varieties are there which are present but the, that thing still continues it might be resolved to a little extent but still it continues because we forget about the casein which is also present in those so those uh, things all only come in our mind when the child reaches to the age of 18 months or around now what are the sources of casein these are the important things which i have highlighted because there is a lot of confusion about some uh, regarding the buttermilk see buttermilk uh, is produced from the dairy products only so these are some of the important uh, sources of casein which i have mentioned which are uh, containing casein so now what is this basic casein and uh, gluten and how uh, it is considered to be a culprit in the body of the children who are on the spectrum see there are two important things are there the uh, gluten in casein it is absorbed completely in our body or if not completely it is absorbed up to 90% and the remaining residues which are present they are called as gliadiomorphin and caseomorphin they get normally eliminated through the stools but in the children who are on the spectrum this ratio gets little reversed a uh, gluten and casein they are not absorbed they are absorbed only up to 30 or 40% the remaining 70 to 60% gets unabsorbed it's remain it gets break down into non uh, absorbable products which are known as gliadiomorphin and caseomorphin now gliadiomorphin is the breakdown product of gluten and caseomorphin is the breakdown product of casein so they are not and the concentration of these in children who are on the spectrum is very very high it may be up to 70 to 80% compared to the neurotypical child where it may be only 20 to 30% so these gliadio and caseomorphins they act as toxins and through the leaky gut they now leaky gut is what basically the normally we uh, the intestines or the mucosal lining is completely it is not detached between the two 
but in children who are on the spectrum there is a gap between the mucosa lining because of this gap in the mucosa lining these toxins of gluten and casein they get enter into the blood stream so as a result when they enter into the blood stream through the blood brain barrier through the blood stream they reach the brain when they reach the brain they get bind to some specific receptors which are present in the microglia microglia is considered just in a very simple language they are considered to be brain cells which are important for the function so these uh, microglia cells they contain some important receptors or called as opiate receptors and when these toxins like gluten and gliadium often casein often they bind to them the child starts developing a symptoms of hyperactivity exaggeration irritability restlessness aggression and they say that the child behaves as though he is in uh, under the effect of morphine or opioid that is why they have they are called as opioid receptors imagine when we take any uh, morphine or opioid we may feel like un unnecessary shouting we may shout we may scream we may not able to realize what we are doing so those things happen when there is an effect of gluten and casein in the child's body so now coming to the leaky gut now why does this leaky gut happens so this is the connection which i was telling so these if you can see these are the mucosal linings which are present in the gut these are interconnected with, with each of these now in the children who are on the spectrum there is a leaky gut appears means to say through this mucosa the all the waste products the toxin they get released they are normally not released because of this barrier which is present these small linings but because of this breakage in the barrier the leaky gut all these toxins are released into the blood stream toxins are normally produced in every individual but the fact is the leaky gut which is the culprit in the children who are on the spectrum which causes the release of all these toxins now why this leaky gut happens now this leaky gut happens there are a lot of theories regarding this leaky gut first of all there is a altered microbiota what is microbiota we know that there are a lot of organisms they are good and bad bacteria the ratio gets disturbed other thing uh, starting right from the conception the type of delivery whether it is cesareans they have a higher chances of developing autism it's not that a child who is delivered through cesarean he will develop autism these are only the these are considered to be some of the proposed risk factors which can lead to autism stress a uh, lot of use of antibiotics environmental factors toxins less amount of naturally produced omega 3 and more amount of omega 6 now omega 3 and omega 6 omega 3 is considered to be good and omega 6 is considered to be bad stress antibiotics gut altered junk food types of delivery so these are considered to be some of the factors starting right from the conception till the these symptoms appear so because of this leaky gut other factors uh, it reaches the brain the toxin goes into the brain so then coming to the gut dysbiosis in a very simple language we call it as a altered gut again what is altered gut means to say there are always good bacteria and bad bacteria are present in our body now they always remain in a harmony so what happens whenever there is an excessive use of antibiotics or toxins or there the immune response of the child gets disturbed so what happens the amount of bad bacteria it reduces the, the increases it might be yeast it can be various other bad bacteria and the good bacteria most importantly bifidobacteria and lactobacilli these are considered to be the two most important good bacteria along with lot of strains which are present in them so their levels decreases and the levels of bad bacteria increases when this uh, ratio gets disturbed there are lot of things which happens there is excess release of toxins there is excess release of various other products through the leaky gut which reaches the brain bind to the receptors and causes all those symptoms now this theory has been postulated even in case of inflammatory bowel syndrome even in case of schizophrenia even in case of parkinsonism and even in case of uh, autism spectrum disorder now the important thing is there is there any test which we can know that yes gut dysbiosis is happening in my child yes there are some tests are there if not direct tests there are some indirect tests are there and these are some of the tests which i routinely go for my parents uh, through with uh, when we are giving when we are dealing with the biomet plan or when we are, uh, we have to go for the gut dysbiosis so zonulin fecal calprotectin stool for propionic acid now stool for propionic acid is one of the most important tests but it is not done in india it is done in by the great brain labs so they are doing those tests so these are some of the various tests which we can detect but uh, the testing for gut dysbiosis is not only important how we have to manage the gut dysbiosis is also very very important 
Now, what is this gut dysbiosis? This is a very simple diagram to make you explain that what exactly dysbiosis means. Dysbiosis means I have told you imbalance. Now, consider this diagram which is present on the left hand side. This is the normal gut microbiota, which is predominantly managed by, which is predominantly being occupied by bifidobacteria and lactobacilli. Now, there are approximately 12 to 13 strains of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, which have found to be deficient in children who are on the spectrum. There have been a lot of studies which have been done on the gut dysbiosis in relation to neurotypical and in relation to spectrum kids. They have found that the uh, strains of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli, they are very, very less. There are some specific 10 to 12 strains are there which are found to be very less in spectrum kids compared to neurotypical kids. Now, these, now what happens? This is the neurotypical child who is having the gut. Now, the children who is on the spectrum see the amount of lactobacilli and the bifidobacteria. The bifidobacteria are the green ones and the lactobacilli are the blue one. See the amount is reduced to such a low extent and the predominantly the gut is being occupied by the all the bad bacteria, streptococci, proteus, yeast, candidiasis. So these are all the bad bacteria which are causing the disturbance in the gut. When the gut is disturbed, the brain will be disturbed as per the theory of gut brain access, which is considered now to be a very, uh, you know, with a good evidence and a good level of uh, supporting evidence to support the brain symptoms, to support the mood swings in children who are on the spectrum, or it may be adults, schizophrenia, or any other disorders. So this is the thing. So in uh, dysbiosis, the amount of bad bacteria are predominantly being increased and lactobacillus and bifidobacterialis. So this excess leakage of toxins by the bad bacteria. So these bad bacteria which are present, they release large amount of toxins. Now these toxins are called as, they causes neuroinflammation and causing the inflammation in the brain and thereby exaggerating or worsening the behavioral or the core symptoms of AST. Now this is one of the latest, latest article which I have been just, uh, I have shared this slide. This is the effect of probiotic supplementation on GI symptoms, sensory and core symptoms in autism spectrum disorder. It was a randomized controlled trial. And uh, if any of the parents who have a background of statistical knowledge, they will be knowing that RCTs are considered to be the best in respect to any other uh, cohort study or prospective control study or retrospective control studies. So RCTs are considered to be the best. And this is one of the latest research article which has been published in Frontiers in Psychiatry in uh, recently, I think September 2020. So they have shown that yes, uh, probiotics, they have a very good effect in resolving the symptoms of sensory uh, core symptoms of autism. And the idea is again, the gut dysbiosis and through the gut brain access. So now coming, what is the effect of overgrowth of yeast in the body? So see, there are a lot of uh, effects of overgrowth, as I've told you, it can be ranging from right from the sensory to the uncontrolled laughter, excessive crying, humming, itching, sleep disturbances, constipations, bloating. Uh, is there any test which we can detect for yeast? Yes, in food intolerance test, we can get an idea about the yeast screening and then we can go for cultures. We, there are stool tests also, which we can enable us. There are biomarkers for the stool in the stool, which can detect the levels of, which can help you in detecting, yes, the child is having yeast issues. Now, then coming to, as I was discussed in the first slide, that uh, why the type of carbohydrate, what we consume is important. See, basically this is in uh, relation to the fungal. This is in relation to the yeast issues. We know that one thing we should always know that uh, yeast, for the yeast to grow, sugar or the glucose is a very, very good medium. So uh, we have to make sure that there is uh, the amount of glucose or the sugar should not be in a uh, very high amount so that it uh, allows the yeast to feed. So uh, in terms of carbohydrate, there are basically two types of carbohydrates like simple and complex carbohydrate. Simple carbohydrates means which provide you uh, energy instantly and complex carbohydrate are those which gives us energy very slowly. Important thing we should know always uh, that white rice, corn, I have uh, marked them in the last uh, line that white rice, corn, maize and potatoes, these are gluten free, but they are considered to be simple carbs because they provide us instant energy and they have a high glycemic index. Glycemic index means that how fast a product or how fast a food raises the blood glucose levels in a body. So any food which raises the blood glucose level very fast definitely the yeast growth will be very fast. 
any food product which raises the blood sugar levels steadily gradually over a period of time the levels of yeast will be growing but will be in a controlled manner but they won't be an excess growth which can hamper the gut so this slide is very very important for us to know to, to differentiate between the simple and complex carbohydrate simple carbohydrates i have told which are very easily consumed for our knowledge we should always remember that simple carbs are those which are partially digested they are not digested fully because they provide you instant energy whenever a thing gives you an instant energy they might uh, not dissolve completely so they are partially digested in relation to the complex carbohydrates they give you energy slowly because they take time to digest and they are digested completely and uh, simple carbs generally include ready made processed food drinks beverages which gives us instant energy that is why we when we take a you know soft drink we get an instant energy so these are some of the simple carbohydrate examples and they have a high glycemic index and complex carbohydrates most of them include non vegetarian diet pulp fruits and green vegetables they are means to say those which are high in fiber diet so for us we should remember this easy to digest and time uh, the complex carbohydrates they are not completely digested they take time to digest now this is the glycemic index chart which i have shown you only there are lot of uh, food products and are there this is the chart we generally give to our parents who are in, uh, involved with us in biomet plan this is for the purpose of yeast issues who are having the yeast issues i have just taken a snapshot of one of the thing so uh, so most of the things like fruits in fruits if we go like banana and watermelon these are considered to be the foods which have high glycemic index but one thing is important there that banana uh, there are now banana is always also written in the low glycemic index now the important thing we should know that whenever we give a banana it should be unripe banana unripe means to say when the peel is green in color there the glycemic index is low and otherwise the banana has a high glycemic index so these are some of the food products which i have mentioned now another important thing is about the effect of oxalates how oxalates is related to diet in children who are on the spectrum see oxalate in the children who are on the spectrum it is mostly produced from primarily from two important sources the diet and the yeast infections of the candida and the consumption of citrus fruits which are rich in vitamin c and it is not in terms related to uh, genetic disorders because there are some genetic disorders like hyperoxaluria which i have not mentioned here where there is a defect in the enzyme as a result of which the oxalate levels keeps on rising so we are not bothered about that in autism the important thing the oxalate levels are high in children who are in the spectrum is more in relation to the human metabolism their metabolism is also disturbed because of the disturbance in the immune system because of the methylation cycles and because of the diet which they consume and the yeast infection now the every child is consuming this probably uh you know uh, you might say that this child is consuming spinach and my child is also uh, consuming spinach then why is oxalate levels are not high and why my child is oxalate levels are high the reason is that the levels of oxalate might be high in both of the kids but in the children who is on the spectrum the levels continue to remain high because it is not metabolized in our body because of the disturbance in the human metabolism so that is the fact we have to give that is why when we go for the low oxalate diet we are eliminating the diet of we are eliminating the oxalate from the outer source we are not reducing the oxalates from the uh, you know from the body we are basically reducing the oxalate from the outer source that is the food products and other thing is that whenever we other factors which can help in reducing the oxalates are uh, reducing the amount of foods which are rich in vitamin c controlling the yeast issues and other important thing is consuming calcium citrate now this is the this is one of the studies which was done and they have found that uh, if we, this is the neurotypical children who on this and this is the spectrum kids so they have found that the level of oxalates were very very high in the urine sample it was in the range of 200 to 300 or 100 between 100 to 300 were the maximum whereas children who are on the spect who were on the neurotypical the levels were much in the range of around 30 to 40 so this is the importance of oxalates in the children who are in the spectrum and these are some of the food products which are high in oxalates low in oxalates and this uh, list we generally do share with our parents uh, when we prescribe oxalates right so these are some of the food products which can give us an idea now coming to the our the main thing the diets in autism so this was basically our understanding 
about the about the various factors and the various background knowledge that why diet is important so because taking into consideration our uh, discussion that we have discussed in the previous slide in relation to that we will be discussing about the various diets in autism now there are a lot of diets among these the most important and the most known diet among all the parents and professionals is gfcf diet or we can take it as gfcf sf which means the sugar free nemechek protocol nemechek protocol i have taken it tentatively uh, i have taken it uh, purposefully in this presentation because i wanted to discuss something in relation to nemechek protocol and then body ecology diet specific carbohydrate diet sara diet and low oxalate diet fen gold diet i have just mentioned the name but it's obsolete no one practices this and there is no evidence now the evidence for this mostly among these elimination diets is more for the gfcf and uh, gfcf sf diet but the other diets like body ecology diet specific carbohydrate diets truly speaking these are basically the modifications of the gfcf diet although the names has been given to them but these are just the modifications of the gfcf diet now uh, what is the purpose of this uh, rational of elimination diets uh, i mean this uh, the restricted diets the diets which are there gfcf these are known as elimination diets because we are eliminating the normal food products from our diet so that is why they are called as elimination diets so why we should go for these elimination diets what is the rational of going for these elimination diets do every child require i have uh, that will be discussing so the main purpose this is the gut brain axis which i have shown the uh, this is the leaky gut which is present this is the brain this is the blood and this is the uh, what we can say the mucosa of the gut now the brain and the gut this is the gut and this is the brain now the brain and the gut they are connected to various they may be connected through the chemicals they may be connected to the vagus nerve they may be connected to the various other neurotransmitters so these are the microbiota the gut microbiota which is present which consists of good and the bad bacteria now when the ratio gets disturbed when the ratio gets disturbed and the amount of bad bacteria increases so they will cause the release of lot amount of toxins and among these the most important toxins they are mentioned like interleukin 1 dnf these are interleukins so we are not bothered about that the important thing is that they release lot of amount of toxins and important thing sfas what are sfas these are short chain fatty acids among them the most important is propionic acid they might be other like butyric and etc but propionic acid is important which causes the inflammation and release of other neurotransmitter uh, i mean uh, neuroinflammatory markers neuroinflammatory means which causes the inflammation of the brain so these neurotransmitter or the inflammatory markers they reach the brain and they cause the swelling so the purpose of these elimination diets is that gut healing prevention now gut healing how that is we are giving good diet we are controlling the yeast overgrowth through the diet so the gut microbiota so every the main culprit is the alternation of the gut microbiota so the elimination diets are mainly focusing on the the elimination diets are mainly focusing on resolving the gut microbiota to as normal as possible so gut healing prevention of the formation of residual toxins so that they can reach to the brain what were the residual toxins gluten and casein which were formed like gliadiomorphin and caseomorphin so if we eliminate the gluten and casein from the diet caseomorphin gluadiomorphin will not be formed regulation of the gut dysbiosis so these are the main rational behind the elimination diets so now the important thing is that do all kids require elimination diets the answer is no it's clearly no because it's not like that if one child is on a gfcf diet yes every child will require a gfcf diet no we have to look into the clinical pictures as we have discussed in the previous slide we have to go for the intolerance test and most importantly the challenge test the gluten casein challenge test what we can do suppose the child is taking a normal wheat chapati and is developing lot of constipation diarrhea we can eliminate the we can uh, eliminate the uh, casein or a wheat products for some period of time say maybe 2 or 3 weeks and then we'll see how the child responds if his diarrhea gut issue settles then we can say yes the child might be having the gluten or might be having gluten uh, issues or gluten intolerance issues so in that case we go for the food intolerance the purpose of going for again for food intolerance is that many a times what we do the child is intolerant to gluten we might give him peanuts we might give him uh, hazelnut brazil or we might give him cashew we might give him coconut we might give him almond but we might forget the child may be having intolerance to those products also so that is the purpose of going for this igg level so that we can exactly eliminate that what exactly the child is having and what exactly the child is having intolerance to which level so the studies have found now why not ige because the studies have found 
that approximately 80 to 85 percent of the kids who are on the spectrum they have high levels of IgG compared to IgE levels. That is why uh, IgG levels are much much preferred to check for the intolerance rather than to check for the IgE levels, which suggest you uh, allergy. So GFCF diet. Now suppose the child has been uh, uh, he's been having an intolerance to gluten and casein free. And so uh, mother decided that I will start on a GFCF diet. So should we start immediately the next day? No, it's not practically not possible because see gluten is present in most 90% of the carbohydrates. So is it, it's not humanly possible that uh, today he was eating a normal diet like chapati, wheat and all uh, products of wheat, ice creams or maybe other things, etc, etc. And suddenly tomorrow you stop all gluten. The child will go in a negative state of nitrogen. He'll be more irritated. He'll be hunger his digestion might get disturbed. It's just like a child who is on a vegetarian diet suddenly introduce non-veg to him, definitely his gut will get disturbed. So whenever we go on a GFCF diet, the uh, important, the most important thing is that we always start with a casein, casein free diet, because casein is limited to only dairy products and we have alternatives to casein. It can be A2 milk, it can be almond, depending upon whether the child is intolerant to that or not. So according, or we can eliminate the milk from the diet because Many a time nowadays kids are not very fond of milk or if we want to eliminate it, we can easily eliminate them. So once the child gets adapted to gluten casein free diet, then we start on a gluten free diet. Now for the gluten free diet, initially we have to reduce wheat, then we have to reduce barley, then rye and gradually and gradually we have to reduce and simultaneously we have to add on a gluten free diet to the child so that there is a balance uh, remains between the diet. So this gluten-free process takes over a period of approximately one to two months. And once the child's body gets adapted to the gluten-free diet, which may be either in the form of amaranth, ragi, joar, bajra, millets, etc. And then we start on an actual gluten and casein-free diet or what we call as a strict GFCFSL diet. So, and generally speaking, we say that by the period of six months, six months we generally take, but within a period of four to six months, the child who is having intolerance to GFCF, the child who is having intolerance to gluten, will get benefits through a GFCF diet. But what is the percentage of benefits? What improvement? That totally varies from child to child. But yes, large improvements have been observed in social isolation, eye contact, learning hyperactivity, stereotypical hyperactivity, and panic attacks. Now, one important thing I would like to tell you here that as of now, there are not much strong papers or literature which is there for GFCF diet improvement. There have been a lot of literature on medicines, but not a literature on GFCF diet. There are not evidence is there, but it is not to a great extent. But yes, evidence is there for GFCF. The most important reason why it is not there, because these studies requires children. And there is a lot of uh, laws to follow. Uh, many times parents are not happy to enroll their child in the studies. So this is the fact, the most important factor, that uh, there have not been much studies which have been done on a GFCF diet. But taking into the experiences of uh, the parents, taking into the experience of the professionals, results on GFCF diet are definitely there, provided if we go in a rationalized manner, taking into consideration the intolerance levels and his nutrition status. Now, casein-free diet. Now, what are the alternatives of casein? Now, first of all, we should understand what is, these are the, some of the alternatives like A2, almond, camel, and coconut. Now, again, there is a question that camel milk. Regarding camel milk, parents say, so uh, is a, a raw camel milk is better or pasteurized? See, raw camel milk is always in any form better compared to pasteurized camel milk. But the reason is that camel milk, raw camel milk acts as a reservoir for a lot large amount of respiratory infections like SARS infections, even the other respiratory infections, other adenoviruses. So taking into the consideration the benefits of raw camel milk compared to pasteurized, the harmful effects of raw camel milk are more compared to the benefits because of the respiratory infections and because the camel milk acts as a reservoir for large amount of respiratory viruses. So as a result, whenever we consume camel milk, it should be in the form of pasteurized. Now, what is this casein free? Now, what is this A2 milk? Now, normally what happens, casein is a protein, we know that. And this is a chart which I have given you, probably this is not very much highlighted, but I'll just explain you, casein uh, basically occurs in different, different forms. It contains beta caseins. Now there are two forms, A1 and A2. Now normally the uh, the cow breed, the desi cow breeds which are present, 
they contain exclusive A2 milk. And the normal milk which is present, the dairy products, they have been hybrid by the composition of A1 and A2. Why this A1 is important or A2, uh, why is A2 is beneficial compared to A1? Because the reason is that this is uh, BCM, that is beta caseomorphin 7. This is one of the breakdown products of casein, which I was discussing in the first slide, which acts as a toxin and it is formed from the breakdown of A1 beta casein rather than from A2. So as a result, what the dairy, normal dairy product, the dairy milk, which we are consuming, it contains more amount of, it contains both A1 and A2. So as a result, B6M7 is formed, that is beta caseomorphin and which acts as a toxin releases through the leaky gut. Other important uh, advantages of using exclusive A2 milk is that the gut issues are better, bloating and abdomen uh, pain is better, it provides better immunity. And another important thing for our point of view is that it promotes the production of GSA, that is glutathione. Now glutathione is one of the most important natural antioxidant which is produced in our body, which acts as a role in the detoxification. We know that there are mitochondrial effects, dysfunctioning is there, detoxification is affected as because of the low levels of L-carnitine, low levels of GSH, the oxidation, the antioxidant stress levels, the stress levels are high, the free radicals are very more. So A2 promotes the production of GSH, which acts as a natural antioxidant. So these are the advantages of A2 over A1. There are a list of GFCF diet. Most of the non-veg diet comes under GFCF. Then uh, under the vegetarian diet, we have mentioned, we know that potato, corn, sweet potatoes, rice, millets, beans, they are all under gluten-free. But considering potatoes, corn and rice as simple carbs, in case of yeast issues, we have to avoid them. Now, regarding the Nemichek protocol. Now, a word on Nemichek protocol. Now, uh, I uh, generally don't uh, prefer to go with the Nemichek protocol. Uh, the reason is because first we'll try to understand what does the uh, Nemichek protocol say. See, the Nemechek protocol says in a very simple language, autism is equal to propionic acid plus inflammation. And what is this propionic acid? Propionic acid, we have seen that it is a toxin or an SFA, which I was discussing in the previous slides, that is short chain fatty acid, which is produced by the various bacteria which are produced in the gut. That is the bad bacteria. And these bad bacteria produce this propionic acid or short chain fatty acid. They cause the release of other toxins like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, etc., etc. They through the gut-brain axis, they reach the brain and causes the neuroinflammation. So in a very uh, single word line or a single line, uh, Dr. Nemichek has explained that autism is equal to propionic acid plus inflammation. Now, how does it, now the whole theory of autism, the whole theory of Nemichek protocol is based on this. So what they do, they basically in the step one, they reduce the amount of propionic acid which is being produced or what we call as a reversal of the bacterial overgrowth or the reversal of the gut dysbiosis. And how they do it? They either do it by the use of inulin, which is a prebiotic, or by giving rifaxipin, which is an antibiotic which is acting specifically on the gut. Or by, and these are the most two important things which help in altering the gut bacteria and increasing the amount of good bacteria. Now, there are one important thing we should know, prebiotic. Now, prebiotic is what and what is probiotic. So we'll be discussing prebiotic here. When we give a prebiotic like inulin, we are, so prebiotic is a feeding material. When we give a prebiotic or a feeding, uh, feeding material, you can say it's acts as a feed. So when we give the feed into the intestine, the bad bacteria as well as the good bacteria, both will increase because they don't know that this feed belongs to me or to the good bacteria. Both of them will act and who wins the race will take the feed. So as a result, children who are taking inulin, they might have bloating issues, they might have uh, don't pain, but this may go in a waxing and waning phenomenon. Mean to say, sometimes they may improve, sometimes may they deteriorate. Sometimes may they improve, sometimes they deteriorate. Because when the good bacteria wins the race for the inulin, that is the feed, uh, the gut will get better. If the bad bacteria win the race, the gut again may get disturbed. So that is the reason. So that is the reason we, uh, I, uh, uh, it's little uh, controversial to say that inulin might be beneficial in long term. Other important thing is that the dose of inulin. The dose of inulin which has been prescribed by Dr. Nemichek is ranges from one fourth or one eighth to two teaspoons. Now, there is no prescribed exact what dose it as for what child should begin. The range is very, very vast. Some children might benefit from one fourth and even some children might get bloating issues maybe gut issues even by taking one fourth of teaspoon. So this is one thing. And other thing is that they prescribe the use of extra virgin olive oil. 
and which is very very good because it's um, it contains more amount of linoleic acid which is rich in omega 3 now why we uh, why we are basically against this uh, little uh, nemechek protocol is little controversial in this step is first we are using inulin now inulin is a prebiotic so it can also promote or worsen the growth of bad bacteria and the dose of inulin is not exactly uh, how much exactly we can give so these are the two important factors which are little uh, controversial in case of nemechek protocol now what is this body ecology diet now basically this body ecology diet is uh, nothing it uh, it is basically you can say it is a subtype of uh, gfcf diet or gluten and casein free diet so this body ecology diet was basically developed by a nutritional consultant and he was john gates and the main purpose for this body ecology diet is to reverse the candidiasis or yeast overgrowth infection so what they basically do they introduce the coconut kefir now what is kefir kefir we know that it is a fermented food product now any fermented food products are always considered there is always again a confusion whether fermented food products are good for children who are on the spectrum whether it might promote or worsen the yeast issues see fermented food products are always good provided if they are not fermented for too long fermentation for a period of 24 to 30 hours and giving that fermented food product is always good because it produces the lactic acid and these are mainly promote the growth of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria which are considered to be very good or the good bacteria for a growth so here they introduce the use of coconut kefir to heal the gut healing because this coconut kefir acts as a natural probiotic now here we have to remember that here we are using the young coconut kefir so and from the young coconut kefir it should be green in color it is not the normal coconut which we use it is the young coconut and this has, and then in the second stage they introduce the raw butter which is considered to be the casein free and along with that in this body ecology diet they also introduce the use of millets buckwheat ragi jowar quinoa so the purpose of giving these grains is to alkalize the body again this is the go alkalize the body means they will help in reducing the growth of the yeast so this is again the purpose of this body ecology diet is to reduce the amount of uh, grow is to reduce the amount of bad bacteria in the body and this is what we follow when we are giving uh, or controlling the yeast overgrowth through the nutritional plan but once there is again suppose the yeast uh, we, uh, for the confirmatory test we generally go for the stool for yeast culture if the stool for yeast culture comes out to be positive then in that case we do have to prescribe antifungal medications now then comes the specific carbohydrate diet now specific carbohydrate diet it, the name itself suggests means we are using some specific carb, type of carbohydrate and in the previous slide we have discussed that we have complex carbohydrates we have simple carbohydrates so here we are using a complex carbohydrate the reason why we use here the complex carbohydrate because if we use a simple carbohydrate then the amount of glucose in them will be or sugar will be high it can worsen the yeast and the aim of this specific carbohydrate growth is in, in, in gut healing or reduce the yeast overgrowth or improving the gut dysbiosis so complex carbohydrates will be more rich in fiber they will be having less amount of glucose so yeast gut dysbiosis will be controlled so complex carbohydrates are generally like millets uh, green leafy vegetables it can be non vegetarian diet fruits so this is the thing which will help in promoting the it will help in controlling the bacterial overgrowth of the bad bacteria and other thing is that the main rational of using this specific carbohydrates diet is that we know that specific carbohydrate we are using complex carbohydrates now complex carbohydrates are the ones which are completely absorbed in the body and once they are completely absorbed in the body they won't act they they will not be any feeding material for the bacteria to grow if some food which you are consuming it is not completely digested and it remains partially in the body it will promote the growth of the bacteria because the bacteria will consume that and their growth will increase then the growth might increase of the bad bacteria so as a result in this specific carbohydrate we are using complex carbohydrates which are rich in fiber which are absorbed completely and as a result of which there is no growth no uh, feed which is left unabsorbed for the bacteria to grow and along with this complex carbohydrate if we use uh, casein free diet then that is considered to be the best for the gut healing casein free diet means either you can use a2 camel these are the varieties which we have discussed now coming to the natural probiotics so most of the natural probiotics which are there they are in the form of fermented products 
and again i have told fermented products are very good provided if they are fermented over a period of 24 to 30 hours not beyond that so these are some of the natural probiotics like tempeh yogurt but again we cannot generalize these things for the children who are on the spectrum the reason because the child might be having yeast over growth issues along with that he might be having case in uh, case in intolerance so suppose without under the guidance of a professional and without under the guidance of anything you are uh, you might start giving him as a you might start giving him a natural probiotic like yogurt or kefir or buttermilk uh underestimating the fact that the child is also having uh, intolerance to casein so as a result in fact giving natural probiotics in the form of yogurt and buttermilk might worsen the symptoms of the child because yogurt and buttermilk they are dairy products they are containing casein so as a result of which in spite of improving the gut issues the gut issues might get worsen so this is the important aspect and the thing that we cannot generalize a diet plan for children who are on the spectrum children who are on the spectrum the diet plan for every child will vary from child to child depending upon his intolerance depending upon his yeast issues depending upon his clinical features that is why till date there is no single treatment plan that can be given uh to all the children who are the spectrum because every child on the spectrum behaves differently and, and uh, if we meet one child on the spectrum you know another child on the spectrum because no two children on the spectrum are similar so that is why we cannot give a dietary plan or we cannot give a meal plan for any child or cannot give any generalized plan for the child that yes this child will uh, this plan will fit to every child who is on the spectrum now what are the advantages of fermentation i have explained that increase in the amount of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria it can control infections these are very good of nutritive value it helps in digestion and they can also help in lowering the cholesterol and can uh, reducing the incidence of cancer so from our point of view its important thing is that it promotes the uh, growth of good bacteria like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria uh this is a word on sara diet it's not considered to be any more important they basically reduce the amount of lutein lutein is present in all the amount of green vegetables spinach and so this diet basically also suggests the elimination of artificial sweeteners but it is not considered to be a diet uh, this was basically a lady who tried giving this diet to his child and he found lot of benefits with that so this diet was introduced by the name sara diet this sara is basically the name of the person or the lady so uh, nowadays it is not considered and there is no rational there is no evidence for this diet also now another important thing probiotics and prebiotics now what should we consume should we consume probiotics should we consume prebiotics what are probiotics probiotics are live organisms which are containing good or beneficial bacteria now prebiotics are feeding materials or feeding feed this is basically feed that is why when we consume we give the prebiotic we are giving the feed now the feed can increase the growth of bad bacteria sometimes it can increase the growth of good bacteria sometimes that is why there is always a waxing and waning on the gut issues and many times parents uh, give their experiences that sir the child was on inulin sometimes he is better and sometimes he is worsening the reason why it happens is because of the waxing and waning of the gut issues the who wins the competition with the feed will win the race now prebiotics can worsen the gut issues as i have told now what probiotics to choose this is another important thing is that there are so many probiotics that are available in the market it is a uh, so what exactly the probiotics which we should choose now this is very important because studies have shown that majority of the children who are on the spectrum that is 7 to 80% of the kids who are on the spectrum have deficiency of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli specific strains there are around 10 to 12 specific strains of bifidobacteria and lactobacilli which are deficient in children who are on the spectrum so those probiotics we are generally prescribing to our parents or kids uh, who are having the gut issues and these probiotics are considered to be psychobiotics or these probiotics which we are giving they are containing specific strains these 10 to 12 specific strains which are found to be deficient in majority of the children who are on the spectrum so the important thing is that just taking probiotic is not important what is the dose and what strains you are taking is very very important so and another thing is that what is the dosage the colony forming unit of these bacterial strain the ranges from at least 1.5 to 2 to 5 billion colony forming units so at least this is the range duration is not very much uh, explained various studies have shown 4 months various studies have shown 6 months but generally once we start with the probiotic we give it at least for a period of 6 months and so these are the various strains which i have mentioned bifidobacteria like brevi bifidob uh, bifidum longum infantis lactobacillus strains bollardi rutri ramesses 
tuberculosis so these are the specific strains of bifidobacterium lactobacilli which are found to be deficient in children who are on the spectrum and when we give probiotics we are mainly focusing on these probiotics containing these strains which are considered to be psychobiotics and so uh, at the end of the slide this is my last slide to just to conclude you that uh, this is a healthy plate method or what we call as a balanced diet which contains fruits which contains vegetables which contains proteins which contain kids a uh, grains and a dairy product so half of the plate is containing with fruits and vegetables half of the plate is containing with grains and proteins and a glass of dairy product but this doesn't good hold for every age kid why because the child may be intolerant to fruits he might be intolerant to vegetables he might be intolerant to kids in so every meal plan has to be modified as per the needs as per the requirements of the child so a healthy plate method or a meal plan doesn't hold good for every asd kid so we have to modify we have to customize each and every plate according to the need of the child so with this i will end my presentation and uh, now we'll go for the question and answer round if uh, parents are having questions then we'll be discussing on those i uh, uh, now i'll forward to dr neha to kindly do the needful yeah parents hope the presentation was helpful so uh, can we have our first question please unmute yourself and ask the uh, questions parents one by one hello sir yeah hello ma'am uh, can you suggest some name of prebiotic hello hello can you suggest some name of uh, prebiotics available in the uh, market ma'am that is what i have told you we have shared the we are uh, given the strains which are available uh, containing these strains the uh, the probiotics which we are using we are generally using the brain biome but uh, you can go for others but these are the major ones which are present we have mentioned the strains which are present and uh, un actually unfortunately these probiotics are not very easily available there are other probiotics also which you can uh, like uh, clear labs on us there but the thing is that again uh, we always because some of the probiotics are also there which may be soya based which may be containing yogurt which may be containing dairy products so again we have to customize to the needs of the child that is my child having a uh, casein issues is he having intolerance to soya because in that case you have to avoid giving those probiotics which are soya based so generally some names are there i have told you like therbiotic is there brain biome is there so these are some of the names which we generally prescribe for our parents but uh, there are other probiotics which are the, which you can uh, get in touch and you can see on the net but the most important ones are the these ones okay thank you sir excuse me sir excuse me sir yes ma'am Uh, sir, the IgG uh, which you refer to is it the same the anti TTG which is done for gluten sensitivity? Ah uh, yes, no uh, that exactly anti TTG. Is, yes, yes, exactly that is anti TTG IgA. We are uh, in there are basically okay. two types of antibodies which we do IgA and IgG. Nowadays, if we are going for the that is for the what we call as the gluten sensitivity. Disease. Now, yeah, yeah. Celiac disease. If we are going, we are going for anti TTG IgA. That is anti endomycial antibodies IgA, which is more specific for celiac disease in relation to IgG. Okay. So, uh, so we got that done for my son, and that was all right. That was uh, not higher. But do I need to get IgG again? Yes. That is yes. Different? Yes. That is specifically for the. That is specifically for the gluten. but okay. when we go for the igg levels we get to know the levels of other food intolerance levels so that is the importance he okay. might not thank be intolerant you. to gluten but he might be intolerant to other food products or casein okay thank you sir okay hello sir yes ma'am yeah uh, this uh, food intolerance the igg test do we need to do separately for different products like uh, for casein no, products no, it comes no it comes by the name food intolerance panel test in the panel they are including each and every food product okay and uh, how is this test done sir how this is done to the blood sample so lalpath and srl major labs thyrocare they are doing these tests Oh, okay. okay, that's fine. Sir, and, uh, what are the fruits? Uh, we what are the fruits we can give to the uh, kids on spectrum, sir? 
see again it depends uh, that's why i was telling that we cannot generalize anything it totally depends upon the uh, intolerance depends upon the levels but generally speaking as such there is no harm as long as the child is not having yeast issues if the child is having yeast issues as i have okay. mentioned that some of the children might be on a gfcf diet but in spite of yeah. that their sleep issues are disturbed they may be having uncontrolled laughter humming lot of eating issues so that might indicate that the child might have uh, yeast issues so in that case avoid fruits which are rich in citrus like oranges kiwis so these those things otherwise and the, and the last you can consume thing, sir uh, this egg can we give egg uh... egg you can egg you can give but again uh, we cannot predict that whether the child will be intolerant to it or not okay. because most of the cases the child might be intolerant to albumin albumin is a protein that is a white portion of the egg because okay. casein when he is intolerant to casein majority of the cases the he will be intolerant to uh, i okay. mean the white part the albumin so, so for a general point if you are asking protein, you can give okay. you can give okay. yolk that is the yellow part but not the white part okay if we do this food intolerance test uh, we will be coming to know what all you, the... yes you will be coming to know each and everything okay thank you sir thank you sir, sir i have a question yes ma'am hello so uh, my uh, like uh, uh, my son is as, as per this uh, food intolerance test uh, he is under currently under gfcf uh, dairy free sugar free and soy free diet so like hmm. sir as you can understand there are several other food which i am not giving so hmm. point is my question to you is that like uh, like this is his growing period right so how do i ensure that he is having this proper nutritional balanced diet and there is no nutritional deficiency that, that is, is the thing yeah, yeah that, so that is what we are telling see first of all the most important thing there is always a myth that whenever the child is on a gluten free and casein free diet his nutrition will subside and he will lose weight he will feel uh, weak as such there is nothing like that because the important thing whenever we start with a gluten and casein free diet we always advise and we always suggest that we have to uh, reduce the gluten free diet very slowly gradually and simultaneously we have to provide the child with the gluten free products in the form of millets ragi or etc etc which whatever we are giving in terms of in relation to the food intolerance so that his nutrition is not disturbed and his growth is not disturbed and as such frankly truly speaking there is not much disturbance in the growth as long as the child is gut is settled his behavior settles that means we are on the right track okay so is there any particular food sir like which we must include in their daily diet see there are as such no particular food but yes you should introduce always complex carbohydrates in the diet complex it can be non veg it can be green vegetables it can be fruits so these are the most important things avoid giving simple ones give yeah, complex carbohydrates okay. but then again again complex carbohydrates these option which i have given they have to be tailored according to the levels of intolerance the child is having hello sir thank you sir yeah. okay excuse me sir i have yes, hello 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 yeah hello hello please i have a question ah. sir hello yes ma'am please go ahead sir uh, my daughter uh, uh, undigested food uh, coming from her stool sir uh, like mm. uh, if uh, if she eating a uh, jack fruit mm. uh, the little bit of jack fruit coming from her stool uh, the like uh, um, lady's finger the lady's finger seeds also coming from stools what the reason i don't know sir the child is in the spectrum yes sir So that is what, ma'am. The, the the child is having lot of gut issues. There is to there is no digestion is being taken place. So okay. there are lot of gut issues. There are lot of uh, gut disturbance is there. So in that case, you have to look into those gut issues. You have to go for some basic test. You have to get in touch either with a professional there or you can get in touch with us. These things indicate that the child is having lot of gut issues. It might be. Uh, what are the tests, sir? What are the tests? Can you uh, can you tell me, sir? What are the tests you need to do? Ma'am, you can drop us an email accordingly. We can tell you. Okay, 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 okay sir. Okay, thank you. But the most you. important is that the one which we have told uh, told you, like food intolerance. So these are some of the basic things. But again, okay. we have to look into the clinical picture of the child. We have to tailor the test accordingly. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Hello. I drop Hello, a mail. I will drop Hello. a mail. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah, sir. Actually, na my uh, daughter 
every day for stool it's like after two days is it fine she is not saying anything pain is there or anything so, but, sorry uh, i i couldn't uh, i couldn't hear the first part of your question yeah my daughter don't go for stool every day hmm. she, it goes maybe after two day or hmm. after one day hmm. it's not very regular hmm. so is that okay or do you think something is wrong see this is not the normal uh, stool frequency the bowel and bladder is definitely disturbed but since okay. it is not affecting the child as long so it is not disturbing him uh, her also but okay. definitely something is there that we have to need into it but uh, right now since it is not disturbing her uh, she is not complaining of any pain and etc probably in the near future sh she might start describing you some form of discomfort so it is better that we should start investigating definitely the discomfort definitely the disturbance is there but it might okay. be on a milder range okay okay Yeah. Hello, sir. Thanks, sir. Uh, sir, uh, uh, regarding this intolerance of food, for example, if the child has sixty uh, percent of intolerance towards orange, so how much time should I stop that food? Uh, is it six months? See, uh, see. First of all, uh, first of all, uh, they the intolerance reports they doesn't give you in the form of percentages. They give you in the levels. Uh -huh. And again, I have told that it is there is no hard and fast rule. that this level is this much we have to give for this much minimum period we take it for 6 months the best thing to judge is reintroduction of the food after a period of 6 months so okay. when you suppose for 6 months you have suppose the child is intolerant to oranges for example you didn't give yes. her oranges for 6 months mm -hmm. and then after 6 months for example you start introducing uh, mm -hmm. say for example small small amount and the child doesn't tolerate that he starts developing some symptoms so probably you, we can say that yes the child is still intolerant his body is not ready to accept but generally speaking if it is in the mild range we go for a rotation diet means to say for 3 months we will keep uh, we will eliminate the diet and after 3 months we will start introducing gradually and gradually and increase the amount till the point the child starts developing the symptoms as soon as he start developing the symptoms we will not go beyond that amount okay Uh, yeah i actually regarding this orange is i have not seen uh, any kind of symptoms when i give him orange so after only after the test i understood that i i shouldn't give but after introducing also i don't know when to i i don't see any symptom i don't know whether i'm missing somewhere or what probably see that is what i'm telling the the symptoms of the spectrum is so wide that we cannot tell that this particular thing is due to this probably he might be having the yeast issue they might be increasing the yeast issues in the body there might be some in the form of might he might develop some uncontrolled after anything we don't know probably the amount which you are giving might be not that much enough that it might cause her symptoms but in future if you keep giving her for a long term the child might start developing the symptoms so the symptoms are totally varying from each and everything and they are very very varied so uh, it's not only that it might uh, clinically it will appear in front of you the child might be having gut dysbiosis which might be going internally it might increasing the yeast issues it might disturbing the gut bacteria and when the things become to such an extent see uh, uh, this is a very hard fact that the disease appears only when it is more than 80% disturb the body okay so probably it is not in that rain that it is giving you the clinical picture probably probably uh, the internal things are disturbing hello sir hello sir sir can you hear me uh, yes i can hear you yeah sir uh, i just want to ask uh, actually my son we have been uh, following the gfcf for almost 3 years now mm -hmm. so uh, but we never got any intolerance test done i mean i did it on the basis of uh, what i have understood from certain webinars mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. getting a igg test done will we still be able to know if he has intolerance towards gluten and casein because he hasn't been having it uh, you know for all these years in spite of that will we still be able to know the intolerance level correctly or will i have to probably introduce him to such food and then get the test see done? the best thing is that initially you start introducing the gluten and casein into his diet and once you introduce the gluten and casein in his diet if you notice that yes he is okay. having some uh, disturbance in his body that itself gives okay. you an indication yes the body is not ready to accept the challenge the challenge test is the best thing and then accordingly once the challenge test is positive it means is not ready to accept then you can go for the food intolerance test at least then you will get an idea yes the body is still not ready and then accordingly in the food intolerance test you can get the levels how much intolerance is there 
हेलो हेलो एम आई ऑडिबल यस यस यू आर ऑडिबल यस थैंक यू सर एक्चुअली आई हैव अ बिग क्वेश्चन माय चाइल्ड इज नाइन ईयर ओल्ड ऑलमोस्ट टेन ईयर ओल्ड यू कैन से is uh, non verbal he had igg positive when he was 2 and 1/2 year old and we just diagnosed the autism igg and, uh, for what found, yeah gluten only igg yes. for gluten test yeah okay, gluten IgG tolerance gluten. he had okay. yes then we introduced him gfcf diet for 1 and 1/2 year and mm. then i gradually started giving him wheat and uh, those products which are not given in gfcf diet mm. uh, earlier he had constipation but after introducing gfcf diet he completely get out of that thing and weaning was softer for him uh, because of gfcf diet hmm. then uh, afterwards when we uh, started everything uh, for him in his diet uh, we uh, uh, sometimes after that we started noticing that he is getting silent seizures means he hmm. get, get vomitings and he chokes himself and uh, uh he just feels pains uh, down okay but we are uh, thinking that this is because of gut uh, disturbances only and not seizures what can you say see that is what i am telling see uh, it's very difficult to tell on your basis that whether the child is actually having silent seizures or not and it can be due to it can be simply yeast issues also because the as you have told that the things have been disturbed now so probably it might be a gut disturbance or definitely it can be silent seizures but again the silent seizures generally come during the sleeping time if the his sleep issues are disturbed and if you are feeling that something unusual specifically happens during the sleeping times or during the night issues then you can go for an eeg because eeg is the only thing which can rule out the silent seizures if the child is having and if the child is having those seizures then definitely we have to look into the cause rather than going into the fact that he is having yeast or the gut issues are disturbed that might be an aggravating factor but might not be the core factor which is responsible for his uh, sleep issues maybe because sir, it is always associated with vomiting only he never uh, uh, get those seizures in sleep so then it is then it is definitely then it is probably because of the gut issues see reflux constipation diarrhea bloating pain these are all common symptoms which are present in the gut of the children who are on the spectrum and again okay. the causes ranges from gluten it can range since you have done for the igg levels only for gluten you didn't go for yeah. casein you didn't go for food products other food products so we are actually not knowing that the child might be having some intolerance to other food products which we are giving to the child you might be eliminating gluten but you might not be eliminating other which might be indirectly hampering his gut that after 2 uh, 8 years uh, i can find these symptoms because see, these uh, see that's so something we are something we are missing something is definitely yeah. being missed if you are having those symptoms after 8 years then we have to look into those things that what is exactly is happening why the child is not having why the child has developed those symptoms after 8 years why not now so probably okay. there might be something which we are missing then we have to look accordingly into that into the detail thing what are the factors what you have consumed what you have give so those things have to be looked upon okay so, right then you what we, would you suggest about diet or any specific test see right now which, which on the basis do? of this i cannot suggest you anything uh, because uh, we don't have a complete picture of the child and again as i have told you we cannot generalize the one thing what i can suggest you right now is you can go for the igg levels for casein and look if those are okay and go for one yeast issues test okay, okay right yeah thank you okay. sir uh, uh, I, all the a2 I, milk is free from casein a2 milk a2, and buttermilk a2, yeah a2 milk is free from casein but not the uh, normal milk dairy milk a2 is milk a2 is free from casein okay both the milk and buttermilk from me yes 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 a2 products a2 paneer a2 ghee a2 oh. curd every a2 product is free from uh, casein okay sir uh, is there a specific test where we can do to find out uh, to, to confirm this you can go dr lalpath lab srl lab thyrocare all of them are doing this test okay sir thank you so much thank you uh, sir from where can we go for a uh, propionic acid test a uh, stool for propionic acid is not been done in india it is only done by great plain labs you have to go for stool for comprehensive analysis they will do that complete analysis in there 
Thank you. Hello, sir. For IgG or uh, LAL path lab or SRL will work, right? Yeah, they are not doing this tool for propionic acid. <laughs> now, uh, uh, we are sir, already running hello. short of time. We'll be taking hello. the last two queries now. Hello, sir. With respect hello, to sir. the camel milk, yes, uh, yes, less milk, uh, uh, pasteurized milk is uh, less harmful when compared to the raw milk, right? Uh, so, is there any specific brand and also how much dosage should be given to the three years old, sir? See, there is no dosage. What dosage has to be given? Uh, these are basically not the medicines. Basically, we are basically, uh, you know, we are modifying the diet of the child. So as long as much the child can consume, it's okay. There is no specific dosage. There is no specific amount that the child should consume this much or that much. It is a normal diet for him. As we are taking, the child should consume like a three meals or two meals as per his requirements. So there is no dosage. We are just modifying his diet. Is there any specific brand, sir? Brand for what? For camel milk. No, there is no specific brand, but the only thing is that it should be exclusive A to milk. There okay. are so many brands you can get it in touch with the, uh, you know, Google, you know, the, the live the, from the uh, farms where they are getting you the uh, basically the raw form of A to milk rather than packed form. As such, there is no exclusive brand which you can uh, I can suggest you for A to, but the important should be exclusive A to milk. I'm asking about camel milk, sir, not E2 milk. Yeah, camel milk, camel milk. I'm sorry, camel milk can tell you. Yeah, okay, sir. Thank you. Sir, uh, when the kid is on GFCF diet and eats something gluten product, what should be done at that time? Uh, that's a very nice question which you have asked because uh, uh, practically humanly it is not possible to eliminate the gluten from day-to-day -day life of the child. The best thing is that what you can do is give an extra dose of a probiotic because when we give the probiotic, we are basically giving live bacteria. So the gluten, the residual products which are formed by the gluten, the toxins, they basically increase effect on the gut. So by giving the probiotics in a good amount, as we have suggested some of the particular strains or the brain biome, which we generally give to the parents, you can give an extra dose with that. At least it will neutralize those Hello. toxins which are produced. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes, uh, the last question of the day are, now. Uh, then we'll be, uh, just a minute, yeah. then we'll be basically closing the session. And if you are having any queries, you can please drop us an email or uh, accordingly we can discuss. Okay. Yeah, ma'am, please. Uh, uh, sir, uh, my son is four year old uh, yes. on mild ASD. And uh, he has no gut issue right now. Means he was not having previously also goes defecation every day. Not mm. showing obvious symptoms. Mm. I am not giving him, him uh, milk for drinking. But sometimes in kheer and all, I am giving him uh, buffalo milk. Okay. And he is not showing any behavioral issues or like that. Uh, and I am giving him chapati also. For around 6-7 months, I had stopped giving chapati. But now I have introduced him uh, since one year. So, what do you suggest, sir? Uh, if these tests are important for him, should I See, go for uh, this? Are you finding any unusual things? Are you finding uh, after introducing any unusual things to the child? No, sir. Some issues are there that like sometimes shou shouting, uh, sometimes a little hand movement, but not as uh, lot so, of. So that means, uh, so that means, if there are no any such symptoms and you are finding that he's comfortable, he's digesting, there is not much gut issues. So the only thing I can suggest to you, you can just go for the yeast issues just to rule out that the type of carbohydrates which we are giving are fine for the child or not. Otherwise, you can continue with the gluten case in which you are giving. Just go for the yeast test. Okay, sir. And would you suggest that every kid should go uh, take uh, a probiotic in diet supplementation? Uh, supplementation, then again, it depends upon the gut issues. But yes, definitely probiotic supplementation doesn't cause any much harm. Not in fact much, it doesn't cause any harm. So supplementation with a probiotic is in fact considered to be good in the children with the uh, in the spectrum, irrespective whether they are mild, moderate or severe. But the, again, the important thing is that the strains, the type of probiotics which I have suggested you. The yeast can be tested so with tool only. Any, any one you can take, but the important the, the thing is that it should be containing those strains of uh, probiotics like bifidobacteria and lactobacilli. Okay, sir. Thank okay. you so much. The yeast is tested by stools? Only. Yes, it is tested by stools. And sir, what is the method to test casein intolerance? 
food intolerance panel test is the name of the test it they will complete, be doing everything it has casein and uh, gluten sensitivity both it tells yes 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 okay thank you okay thank you uh, we'll be closing up the session now and i request dr neha to kindly Uh, so thank okay. you everyone for joining in and um, i hope it was useful for all so if you have any further queries you can uh, connect with us on our whatsapp or parent telegram group uh, they will be giving you the answers or you can drop us an email at giggleclinics@gmail.com that is g i g g l e s c l i n i c s at gmail.com or you can also send us a whatsapp on 8178 One six three zero six six. So the number has been provided in the chat box, and you can connect with us for any query. And uh, we hope to see you very soon with our new webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Have a good day. Thank you, parents. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Neha. Thank you. Thank you.